So we're starting a new period of art called the Rococo. Um, so the Rococo really begins with the, an event. The event is the death of King Louis XIV. He dies in 1715, and when he dies, it is as if the aristocracy sort of breathes a sigh of relief. Um, they spent their entire life following, uh, following King Louis and serving him and being dedicated to the state. And so because of that, um, the aristocracy are thrilled to return to uh, Paris. They move back to Paris and um, because of their, or because of King Louis' death, when they move back to Paris, art changes. A new period of art uh, emerges. Um, art in the Rococo spans from about 1750 to 1770s. It comes from the French word rochalai, which means shell-shaped or curvilinear. Um, it's soft. It utilizes pastel colors. Um, all of the forms in the painting tend to be curvilinear. And um, it's often seen as a feminine style. It marks the European aristocracy's turn to the pursuit of pleasure, which we refer to as hedonism. Um, Though the Rococo is an outgrowth of the French Baroque style, the class really uh, should be able to detect a change from the Baroque to the Rococo. Uh, the Rococo is essentially a stylistic rebellion away from the moral and formal rigidity that we saw in the French Baroque. Um, it's playful. It's relaxed. It's delightful. It's foo-foo. Basically, architecture in the Rococo was heavily influenced by Borromini. If you remember right, this is Borromini's San Carlo alle Quattro Fontaine. Um, it is the church that he designed. Uh, if you remember right, this church sat at a corner um, and the public hated this church because the door seemed as if it was in the wrong place. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see the edge of the fountain here to um, peeking through on the slide. What did they like? What did the Rococo architects like about the um, facade? They liked the way it undulated in and out. They loved the detail that the building had. They loved the uh, extra frivolousness in terms of the um, extra details and extra um, decorative elements that you see in front of you. This is Germain Beaufrand's Salon de la Princesse. Um, it is probably the most famous of the Rococo buildings. Um, it is a salon. The salon was a place that was made um, based on an oval instead of a hallway um, as if so when we compare the hallway of the um, of King Louis the 14th in which he promenaded from one end of the other uh, to worship the Sun we see a completely different room in terms of its architectural style in terms of the architectural style uh, the Rococo buildings tended to be buildings that their floor prints invited lingering. They invited partying. There was no beginning and end to the room. It was oval. And so you entered and exited the room, but it didn't feel as if the whole point of the room was to begin at the beginning and exit at the end. Um, it invites you to stop and linger. 
and invites you to have a conversation. All of the furniture that is in the room was designed specifically by Beaufron. Um, Beaufron was really the very first interior designer of um, in art. And you can see how the um, moldings become very much a part of the visual art in the um, room. You see how the moldings start at the floor and give detail to the walls and crawl up to the ceiling. Uh, there really is no differentiation between the ceiling and the wall. Uh, the moldings help to sort of bridge that gap between the ceiling and the paintings. Um, some of these salons have lavish paintings in the ceilings. Um, it just depends on the location of the salon. Uh, Rococo interiors were interiors that were famous in Europe from Paris to Russia to um, some places in Italy. The point of these rooms were to party, to linger, to have lavish feasts, to play cards, and to um, enjoy each other's company. Ultimately, uh, the typical Rococo meeting of the aristocracy would be a time in which people were um, having lavish parties. Um, people from the aristocracy would spend their time visiting each other's homes. There really was not um, public things to go out and do. You could go uh, to uh, the, you could go to the local brothel. Of course, that was some place that only men went. Or you could go to the local tavern, or you could visit each other in each other's homes. Um, in this case, visiting each other in each other's homes, ladies during the day would sit and play cards, be tutel, be taught um, needlepoint. They would learn art history. Uh, and the whole point of that was to train them to be uh, interesting to men. Why? Because the woman's um, place in society was secured through her marriage to a man. Um, a lot of times, women who were part of the aristocracy would have a title, and their title would allow them to um, marry a man that had a large amount of wealth. Um, in this way, the aristocracy secured their positions in society and secured their financial well-being within society. Um, once the man married a woman who um, maybe had a large title but not a lot of wealth um, because something happened to the father in the um, scenario, then the man takes on the care of her family. He takes on the care of her sisters, he takes on the care of her parents, or most likely her mother. Um, so a family that had lots of women and not very many men were often um, vulnerable. And so this charade of entertainment through the aristocracy secured the female's um, place in society. It meant that she would be taken care of and not out on the street. Women did not have a whole lot of options once they lost their wealth. Um, their options really were to work in the brothel or to find a house that would be willing to take them on as um, a maid or a governess, um, in which case the pleasures that she enjoyed in life, um, card playing and um, leisure time activities would go away. Um, they would go away and her safety would be a uh, concern. Here's a close-up of the wall, the ceiling to wall, um, ceiling to wall joint, I suppose. 
the um, ceiling to wall differentiation in the room and you can see that basically there is none the moldings um, at the top basically uh, crawl up the wall into the ceiling and you can see the beautiful paintings at the edge where the ceiling would normally um, meet the wall and so in this way um, that shell shape is represented in architecture the next few slides we will compare the differences between the um, Hall of Mirrors and the Salon de Princess. This slide shows a comparison between the Baroque Hall of Mirrors at Versailles and the Salon de Princesse. And you can see here by comparing the two slides how the Palace of Versailles is a, like a hallway, whereas the Salon de Princesse is round and invites um, people staying, whereas the hallway provide, invites promenading because there's nowhere to go in a hallway but from front to back, whereas the Salon des Princesses is round and invites people to stay and meander and converse. Um, you can also see that the Hall of Mirrors has a distinct line where the crown molding differentiates the wall between the ceiling. And even though the paintings seem to curve up on the ceiling, there's still this definite um, division line between the wall and the ceiling, whereas at the Salon des Princesse, we see that the walls and the ceiling kind of melt together. So this is the work of Francois Cuvier. Um, it is the palace in Munich, Germany. And you can see that they sort of combine the idea of the Hall of Mirrors with the Salon des Princes. Um, there aren't paintings on the ceiling, but you can see how the molding crawls up the ceiling uh, towards the top of the rotunda in the room. You can also see how it is round which is inviting for um, lingering uh, and partying. There is a red carpet that goes completely through the room. Um, this is part of the palace, and so because of that, um, you don't get that contained feeling that we got in Paris. Um, by the way, the um, word hotel comes from the Rococo uh, era, because a lot of times they would name these rooms that invited lingering, invited partying, invited sitting and staying a while, a hotel. Um, so the American word hotel, the concept of the hotel came from the Rococo time period. So this is um, the interior of Amelie Berg. And you can see a close-up of the Hall of Mirrors, but you can also see a close-up of the um, interior of another one of the rooms in uh, the hunting lodge. It is, um, you can see that it has a sense of delicateness that we saw in the Salon des Princes. Um, even though it's Russian, it's still done by a French Rococo designer. Um, and he designs not only the walls, but the furniture that goes in the room as well. It has this sense of delicateness to it. Um, pink, pinks and light blues and delicate color palette are used. We have these large spacious windows that allow lots of beautiful light to come in the room. Um, and we know that, that, um, this was influenced by Borromini's fluid, um, curvilinear designs in the buildings that he did in the Baroque time period. Um, it feels sort of like an open air trellis because of the mirrors behind the ornamentation. It has a spindly feel. It's elegant um, and definitely about excess. There's an artist that brings about a, about depth um, to the style of Rococo. Uh, his name is Antoine Watteau. Um, and in painting, he is the inventor, inventor of 
the uh, Rococo style. As we get later and later into painting and the Rococo, um, we find that the style becomes somewhat shallow. It's more about pleasures of the flesh and hedonism and excess. But in the beginning, Antoine Watteau um, events a style that has a sense of beginning and end. Um, he paints a lot the aristocracy and pleasure activities, leisure activities, like attending the theater, playing music, or picnicking outside. They're leisure activities in which they're fraternizing with each other. Um, we mark these paintings with a term called the fête galante, or an outdoor party. As festive and pleasurable as the uh, fête galante paintings are, they're often tinged with a bittersweet sense of sadness and awareness that pleasure is fleeting and will soon be gone. Um, Watteau was the inventor of this theme, of this type of painting, and it sets the fashion for the new Rococo style in 1717 for the next 50 plus years. He explores themes of love and pleasure, um, but the later Rococo painters really don't stop and incorporate that tinge of sadness. They're simply painting about the themes of love and hedonism, but they're not painting about the end of the themes of love and hedonism. Watteau's most famous fête galant is a work that um, came right after Louis XIV's death in 1717. It was exhibited in the annual salon at the French Royal Academy, and it caused such a sensation that the style becomes fashionable. Um, Cythera is where the painting scene takes place. It's an island in which Ve that Venus lands upon um, when she's born. Uh, Cyprus and her, sorry, give me a second. Okay, so the group of aristocrats that are in the painting are all paired off in couples. Um, they've made the pilgrimage to Cythera, uh, metaphorically speaking, and they've come to this sacred island to pay homage to their love of one another. Um, to state the state of being in love. The couple to the right has laid garlands of roses on the sculpture of Venus on the island, but the man is starting to get up and another man is helping a woman up. And further to the left, you see a file of figures descending down a hill to take a boat from this enchanted heady place of love back to the world of everyday cares and responsibilities. The state of being in love is like being in another world, and this painting almost seems to be a dream. The colors and the brushwork breathe uh, love. They feel sensual. Um, they're, they grace across the canvas like tinted steam. They're fleeting. And the brushwork feels fleeting. Uh, the woman that stands at the crest of the hill takes one last longing look up at the place where their worship of Venus had taken place before she descends into down the hill and into the boat. Um, the paintings also mingled with enchantment of this tribute to love. Um, it has a sentimental meditation on the fleetingness of pleasure. It seems that they have just arrived, but yet they already have to turn around and leave. Um, it's a painting that talks about how fragile the precious pleasures of love really are. So the superstar painter Watteau dies, and after he dies, Beaucher um, becomes the it painter for Paris. Um, Beaucher's dad was a painter 
And so uh, what, or Beaucher gets a job in an engraving shop where he reproduces Watteau's work. Um, he eventually goes to study in Rome at the French Royal Academy School in Rome, where he becomes influenced by two major women. One was his wife. Um, she often modeled for him and she was an artist herself and King Louis XV's mistress, Madame Pompadour. Um, Beaucher's main patron was Madame Pompadour and um, his main artistic supporter was Madame Pompadour. Uh, Pompadour was an artist and she took lessons from Beaucher. Uh, and in 1735, the palace commissions decorations for the royal residences at Versailles from Beauchet. Um, in 1755, he becomes the chief inspector at the Goblin's Tapestry Factory. If you ever go to Paris, uh, you will find on the subway uh, the Goblin stop. That is where the old tapestry factory existed. Um, his art, because he works at the Goblin's Tapestry Factory, is more of a public household name than any of the artists that we've seen before him. So because of industry, basically, he becomes more of a household name in terms of art being an artist. Eventually, he becomes the first painter to King Louis XV, where Louis XV um, requests paintings of royal portraiture, uh, mythological pictures, and also erotica. Um, erotica that depicted the adventures of Venus. Um, that erotica was for private viewing only. This is Beaucher's girl reclining, Louise O'Murphy. Louise O'Murphy was uh, King Louis XV's teenage mistress, and Beaucher paints her reclining on a settee. She lays nude across it, uh, face down on the blanket, looking out at uh, a painting or something off in the distance. She uh, had been posing for the artist um, this is sort of like an aftermath of posing for the artist as she looks out at a painting um, that maybe the artist painted of her. Uh, how do I know that? There are roses on the floor that she would have been holding as she posed for him. Um, but all of the French uh, fineries are presented in this portrait. You can see the beautiful tapestries and the textures of the tapestry, um, the juxtaposition of the tapestry with uh, the sheets against her skin, make her skin look more soft and supple. So let's look at Jean Honoré Frogonard's The Swing. Um, and I apologize ahead of time, my French is not good in terms of pronunciation. Um, I can read it just fine, but pronouncing it is a little bit hard for me. Uh, why? Because my original research language was Spanish. Um, Henri Fragonard's The Swing is a painting that was, uh, the subject was dedicated or dictated by the patron um, who commissioned it. Uh, the man on the right that you see is the bishop. Uh, he's pulling the cords behind the young lady who is on the swing. And as he moves the cords back and forth, uh, the swing, uh, it allows the swing to move. And of course, she's gotten, um, you know, how you teach a young child to swing. You push them from the back and then they start to kick their legs. And uh, as you keep pushing, the swing continues to move. Well, instead of him continuing to push her, he pulls his cords back and forth and allows the swing to move back and forth. Um, as the swing moves back and forth uh, and she climbs higher and higher, she climbs over top of this rose bush. And in the rose bush, uh, her lover is hiding. Um, he hides and as she swings over top of the rose bush, she parts her legs and gives her lover a peep show. 
Um, we see a lot of overt landscape that is lush and bountiful. Uh, the lover is very excited about the peep show that he is seeing, um, and he's about to squeal with delight. Uh, above him, you see a sculpture of Cupid uh, with Cupid's finger to its lips, telling him to be quiet. Um, <clears throat> the brushwork is prominent, and the subject matter is completely frivolous. Um, Almost as soon as the Rococo gets a lot of uh, a lot of um, as soon as it gets truly going, momentum was the word I was hunting for. As, as soon as it gets momentum, um, another style comes along and emerges that completely rejects it. Uh, but for now, I'd like to look at the um, architecture that we see in the Rococo. In painting during the Rococo, uh, we definitely see a change from discussing moral issues with the viewer to um, having paintings focus on hedonism. Um, they focus on romantic entanglements, on secret affairs. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, ideals of society and where women fit in society. Um, the extramarital affairs were highly um, common and this painting by Fragonard that you're seeing here is one that is no exception. Uh, there's a woman, she's waiting secretly for her lover. Um, she sits in the garden as her lover approaches and they meet in secret. Um, this style of painting really marks the effigy of eroticism in the court. Um, we know that the court often had um, relationships that were extramarital. Uh, the aristocracy moves to business-like arrangements when it comes to marriage, just like the court has for thousands and thousands of years. Um, marriages amongst men and women in the court were often done to secure um, the right to rule. They were done so that um, countries could make alliances and so that the aristocrats had power and wealth and social control. Um, the aristocratic class of society who served the king now has taken on that type of social structure. And so when we talked about women's place in society, um, it creates a situation where marriage is nothing but a business relationship. And um, in a little while in England, you'll see that that's happening as well. And here, um, Fragonard captures a extramarital affair going on um, where the woman stayed and waited for the man, her lover, to meet her um, so that they could have uh, an encounter.